We are offering a drop of society and university fundraising campaign so that everyone everywhere can have access to clean water and sanitation. We've organised this event as part of Watery's big history project, something that we'll hear more about later, which is an opportunity to look back at the history of taps and toilets where we live to uncover the stories of how we escape from our unsanitary paths. There is still a real need in many countries for these essential and taken for granted amenities, and hopefully through the course of this evening's talks, their importance and implications for the health and livelihood of people will be revealed. So this evening promises to be gross, fascinating and compelling. Looking into Edinburgh's unsanitary history to see how taps and toilets really can transform places and lives. So we'll begin with Richard Rogers and take us uh, on a visit back to the 19th century Edinburgh, where the water situation was not as we know it today. Um, then Naomi Goodbury will explore how a lack of water in Yorktown also meant a lack of sewage with dirt and disease rampant in the Victorian slums. Luckily, a lot has changed since the 19th century, and Roy Dell will introduce us to how Scottish water are provided in Edinburgh with its famously good drinking water. Uh, while we in Edinburgh enjoy the luxuries of clean water and adequate sanitation, the same cannot be said for other parts of the world. Uh, now, unfortunately, tonight our speaker, Stephanie Brown, has come down with a blue and lost her voice. Um, so, unfortunately, the mysteries of the shipscape will become farther, which is going to talk to us about. Uh, might have to be revealed at another time, and um, we'll hopefully be organising another event about this, so do keep an eye on this, and we'll uh, keep in touch with you about that. Um, so, our final speaker will be Alex Scott, who will talk to us about World Trade's big history projects um, and the run up to the decisions about the sustainable development goals later this year, and he'll also be reflecting on his personal experience of World Trade's work in India to some of the parallels that can be drawn uh, to historic Edinburgh. Um, so, we'll have a few minutes of questions at the end. So Richard Rogers is Professor of Economic and Social History at the University of Edinburgh and has published widely on e the economic, business and urban history of Britain since 1800, recently including Insanitary City, which reproduces Dr. Little John Clanmark report on the sanitary condition of Edinburgh of 1865 and provides an insight into the links between poverty, employment and public health in Victorian cities. Ongoing research involves projects in the development of public health in Victorian Scotland. So I'll pass it to you now. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk obviously about the history of water in Edinburgh particularly, but I think it's got lots of parallels for modern policy. To start with a slide of smoke. I just invite you to think that there's a relationship between the smoke and the water, and I'll come to that a bit later. And it forms the title page, the public page of Insanitary City, now available to my surprise in Blackwoods. And here's the report, the report itself, published in 1865. And I'm pleased to say that the Department of Public Health that's in the city and also at the University School are going to recognize this as a 150th anniversary of the publication of what I think is a path-breaking piece of research and work. And the man who undertook this, Henry Littlejohn, was in the post from 1852 as police surgeon then from 1862 as Medical Officer of Health, down to 1908. One of those great Victorian servants who did a long shift and saw and monitored uh, what became uh, the, the public health policy of the city. Um, I'll say a little bit about him, but I don't want to say too much. He had uh, four jobs. I think that's significant. He was police surgeon means he was responsible for the health of the police, their ability to do their job. He was also a crime witness, therefore, in any of the unexplained uh, deaths in the city. He lectured in medical jurisprudence, which meant that he had responsibility uh, to say something about public administration and the way policy would be, could be implemented in the city. He was medical officer of health for the city, first medical officer in Scotland uh, from 1862, as I said, medical officer to the Board of Supervision. That means he was 
the chief medical officer for the poor law, and therefore all the best practices and all the ideas were disseminated from Wick to Stranraer, from Portree to Kirkcaldy. It didn't really matter. Whenever there was a public health issue, it was on his watch, and he wrote many reports uh, about these places. So as a pivotal figure, a number of distinguished uh, positions. It was knighted in 1895, which uh, uh, I like because it suggests it was easier to get knighted than it was to be professor at the university when he was uh, 75. He also had a testimonial room sent to him on the occasion of getting the chair of uh, uh, his, his university. Three and a half thousand of his students signed this. Now, they populated many, many of the public health authorities in Britain. Many of them, including his sons, uh, took positions in England. And many of these were in the empire. So this is a scheme of public health education which transcends the boundaries of Edinburgh a very long way and had significance well beyond uh, the town. The context of this that I'd like to sort of set is that there were over 100 mills on the water at Leith, not all operational simultaneously, and not all of them uh, uh, water mills with, uh, with, with for grain, pounded lead, they made flour, they did all sorts of different things. But the fact of the matter is that they all used water power right the way through well into the 20th century. Not all of them, of course, there are still a few to be seen. Here is a view you probably recognize of the water weight. And I want you to notice here the pavementing, how little flow there is in the river. Now, this is again a general phenomenon. And one of the problems that Edinburgh had with water weight and all those mills was that they took so much water out of the system, it was impossible to scour the bottom of the river. So you need a basic understanding of civil engineering to make that water flow sufficient to cleanse all the rubbish that's coming down in the river. Not just human waste, waste from flour, from paper mills in particular, pollutants further upstream. I'm always sorry for leaf because it's still making its way down there with all the stuff that uh, Edinburgh tipped into it. Now, I'll come to this later, but many of these uh, middle class properties on the cliff here above the water beneath were not sewered, but had a kind of drain away uh, uh, into the water beneath. And that was the issue which in the 1850s particularly agitated the fewers, the heritage, the residents of the new town. They were dripping, soaking away their waste into the city. They wanted a new sewer. They wanted to put the cost of that sewer on the city, and the city wasn't happy about it. There was a big uh, investigation. The Lord Provost went to London and got his fingers properly wrapped over it and came back and sacked, without any kind of right of reply, the police surgeon, George Glover. And that's what issued in Henry Littlejohn in his stead, in his place, in 1854. Now, that's the immediate political context and some of the background to the water context of Edinburgh in the 1850s. But there were other major factors which affected the effectiveness of public health policy. And these are four very considerable issues. One, there was a new system of rating and local taxation introduced. There was no list of properties and no list of streets when Henry Little John took over in 1862. How can you manage your water? How can you manage waste? if you don't actually know what the list of streets and houses is. There was civil registration, very important, 
this was the first time that there was births, deaths, and marriages registered officially in a civil capacity, not just in parishes, in uh, Scotland. And so here is major legislation bedding in, but for the first time providing a cause of death in a public matter, in, in public documents which could be consulted. So there's a statistical underpinning which then became uh, more practical to understand. There have been dual authorities. The police Commission dealing with clean, cleaning the courts, clean, cleansing the streets. Uh, uh, we may not have a particular paper on Shitscape, but I'm going to give you one anyway. And that police commission was collapsed in 1856 to make a single unitary authority. The first time ever there was a unitary authority for Edinburgh in 1856. And that resulted in a boundary extension which uh, brought together all these different parts. So you see here lots of different wards, lots of different parts. Detached here, there's a wee chunk over at uh, Leith Street here, which is uh, detached and part of a different parish up here. So, this is an administrative mess. And I think one of the things to take away in terms of policy is it's very difficult to influence anything consistent and meaningful without a consistent administrative hearing and administrative structure. That's what Edinburgh got for the first time in 1856. Now, I mentioned some of the difficulties that Edinburgh had. This is the Manure Act. I think I'm the only person who can claim this, to have a graph of the amount of shit that was collected from the streets of Edinburgh. And the amount here is worth £6 million pounds a year in today's money. So the City Council had a serious vested interest in not doing anything about the collection of this uh, in the course of the 1840s and 50s. This is data taken from the late 1830s through the 1840s. So an average of £6 million pounds in our money was being used from selling the manure onto various farmers at Craig and Tinney, anybody who plays golf at Craig and Tinney would know that there's a very good light to be had in the golf course there. And out to the west, beyond uh, taken out from Fountain Bridge to farms on the west, increasing the value of these farms considerably, it should be said, at the same time. So very little interest from the city council in doing anything about this in a context of complete and utter bankruptcy. The city had been bankrupted in the 1820s and 30s by a whole range of things, including the expenditure of leaf docks, laying out new streets in the new town, laying a few sewers, and so <coughs> forth. So any source of money was good, was good news. The setting for that visually is a multi-story Stockholm, multi-story Edinburgh. This is a really very important factor, I think, public health and water engineering of Edinburgh. How on earth can you get water to that height or even to four stories before the kinds of understanding of hydraulic engineering and the power it's required to get it to that height? So for the, for the most part, a few exceptions, well into the late 19th century, water is only really available at the ground floor level there and the, and the toilets beside. There are some exceptions to that. So here are some typical closes. These are the numbers of people. There are 179 people in Gowanlock's line off the cow gate. You can see the distribution by the numbers of rooms, children, and so forth. And look at the number of sinks. Two sinks, 179 people. One water closet, 179. Same here in Middle Market there. More people, no sinks, no water closets. Not surprising that you're going to hear, I think, rather later about some of the consequences of that kind of environment. Some more cases here of the same sort of thing. A few sinks in Elphinstone's land, Stocks land, none at all. So it's not surprising 
that in this context of uh, a very limited water supply, what there was uh, heavily polluted and very difficult to dispose of, it's not surprising that we get in the central districts, the most crowded districts, at the kind of trans the giants of the grass market, that we get the highest number of cholera deaths, fever deaths in the 1840s, and in the 1850s. This all data that had been collated uh, by the gym. So here's the problem. You have here the wards, you have here Little John Sanitary Districts, I'll say a bit about that in a minute, and here are the birth deaths marriages in the registration districts. This is an absolutely miraculous piece of arithmetic to take the deaths from all causes here and convert them into, uh, sorry, here, 90 different places with different boundaries is an absolutely amazing case. You have to get the deaths, you have to get the numbers of people that were in, uh, say, St. Andrew's Parish, the registration district, recalculate each of these and the number of deaths before you can get a crude death rate. And you have to do it for every disease. And that's what Little John did. Thousands and thousands of calculations. No Excel, no spreadsheets, no calculators, just logs and a part-time clerk. So here are his districts. And he tries to break them up to understand the social topography of the city. This is what Fountain Bridge looked like. With a very, very interesting for our purposes this evening. Here's the canal basin, but the abattoirs in here, the uh, meat market uh, on this side, and some of the big, big industrial complexes on here. So Little John says, this is how it starts, and, and nobody would these days want to start a piece of work this way. If I had a student that was writing this, I would say break it into two. When the Act for the Registration of Birthdays and Marriages was extended to stop the meeting, the first making possible to ascertain with precision the totality of our cities, and so it goes on. It's a terrible first sentence, but it emphasizes how data, clear analysis of the data, breaking it down into social characteristics and areas is a fundamental part of understanding how it happened, whether it's to do with water or other forms of epidemic disease. And here is a typical table with all the different districts with the deaths due to a particular cause uh, given in rank order. We'll see that Tron, Grass Market, etc., etc., are the ones most affected even in this. So I want to stress, and again I think it's a very enduring factor, that in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, and beyond, this triangle of poverty, work, and health are critically interconnected. And one of the really important debates in Edinburgh in the 1840s, well before that too, conducted through the Church of Scotland and what was to become the Free Church and the Evangelical Church of Scotland, was how do you deal with this problem uh, of health and poverty? And for some, the solution was to deal very much on a sort of individual basis, looking at what was called the Godly Commonwealth mission which directed the moral improvements and conditions of the poor and others who saw a much more expansive idea about keeping people in work because then the cycle of uh, uh, health and uh, poverty and health would not become cumulative uh, down the street. So this is a very important <coughs> cradle in the middle of the 19th century about the relationship of work, health poverty and water of course is very much at the center of this. So the emphasis of Little John's public health policy was very much concerned with morbidity, so quality of life if you like, rather than the age of death. And he deals with this in these different ways. You see how diverse his notion of public health is to do with diseased meat, bakeries, cows, 
Stanbridge in particular, and also water supply. Now Edinburgh was quite well blessed, and I'm sure you'll hear, with good quality of water. Here is one of the first of the reservoirs. You can walk past this uh, when you walk past uh, And there were concerns only in the case of drought. Very poor rainfall affected Edinburgh's ability to uh, manage its water, and that's what's represented in this episode from the Scotsman. Most of the water was managed uh, from the big reservoir at the top of um, the Long Market. It's still there, actually, opposite to the uh, camera obscura and then distributed through the wells and channels through the various uh, places throughout the city. Some years were very bad, in which case uh, there was a very high incidence of uh, deaths when water was in great shortage. And gradually, it were built these wonderful reservoirs uh, throughout the 19th century, um, and uh, using basically a system whereby um, the water was led in from Anic Hill here into the city. So coming through from the course first of all and then from these near reservoirs here also from some springs nearby at the Great Now that's about supply. Here is another issue about disposal. So here is a map of 1869 of the drains uh, in Edinburgh. And you see them here, they look quite comprehensive, quite extensive. A lot of drains all over the city. But when you look at it in detail, lots of places aren't connected. So here in the area road, you see the end of the sewer here. But to make the street not connected, not connected here, areas here not connected to the main sewer. So lots of the new town and the old town were unconnected to the sewers. These were mostly, therefore, concerned with the rainwater runoff and none of the internal areas of the closes and courts was really successfully connected. And so more effective was the introduction of toilet blocks. So this was achieved, and if you just look at these two areas here, Paul's Court here, let's look in here, and you see the toilet block here, the trees introduced. So it's cleared, and the central block provided. And this has more effect by improving this infrastructure in this way than the problems that would be associated with water in the houses. Little John vigorously opposed the introduction of water closets. Now that seemed counterintuitive to us, but he recognized that first of all it was very difficult to get the water high enough, and it was very difficult to engineer these decaying, decrepit tenements and the costs associated with that to achieve a sufficient level of provision to really make a difference. So unless and until that was achieved, he was determined that they would not enact the requirements to connect to sewers. Better, he thought, to deal with the detail, the low cost, minor changes, like the design of drains, so that you wouldn't have some backwash uh, from the uh, street. So his knowledge of the city and his awareness of the internal arrangements of the city were very sensitive and helped him uh, write the report. Now, just uh, by way of taking this in a different direction, Edinburgh is a very industrial city and has been until quite recently. Over half the men in the city have been able to get their employment from industry. Quite a lot of women, this is quite a high proportion generally. Most of them, of course, many of the majority in domestic service. And the growth of manufacturing employment was higher than that of professional employment throughout the, the 19th 
16th century. And if you reflect on that, you'll remember that this is a city with lots and lots of industries needing water. And of course, the steam and the smoke associated with that created huge environmental problems. All breathing can only be all breathing effectively if there's all that soap burning, all the chemical works, the foundries, the North British rubber works, and so on and so forth. Not necessarily major works in the way that we get in, say, Middlesbrough or in iron smelting ever there, but nonetheless, lots of smoke. And so here you have the cause of some of the difficulties. Water taken out for industrial purposes, belching smoke into the environment, creating this difficult terrain of water leaf, laterally improved, this so-called pavement in here, to show uh, that Edinburgh and its industry was a major consideration. Here, the, the tallest uh, the chimney in, in Scotland uh, was created at Torai and it's still standing. This is a bit difficult to see, but all of these spots are where smoke polluters were, were sent notices in 1854 to cease doing so. One of them was that one that I've just shown, who relocated from the water leaf to Dalai. So all of these are folk who are belching out smoke, burning it through creation of steam engines to create whatever power they needed for mills or foundries or for joinery work, whatever it was. And so Edinburgh is heavily reliant on industry, and its industry is heavily reliant on its coal and on water necessary. Now, I don't expect you to see this, but it represents the degree of information. This is a portion of the data collected in 1874. And numbers, I think about there, 133 columns of data about houses with and without facilities of one kind or another. So this is not a city that's becoming complacent in its condition, but is very heavily conditioned by the situation it finds itself in, in terms of industry and water. It finds a solution of sorts in knocking things down, just like knocking down for the um, uh, uh, lavatories of the trees. So knocking down some of the worst courts here. And here is the area to be developed in 1867. You'll know it as Jeffrey Street and Chambers Street and New Street and so on. Uh, uh, and these are all parts of that scheme. So improvement took place not really through water engineering, but as much through the demolition process as anything else. Very elaborate plans to achieve that compensation claims for the improved streets. So here's the man, aged 81. Um, I hope he'll be rehung, if that's the right term, in the National Portrait Gallery. And uh, he has, through his uh, report, produced one of the most important uh, documents, certainly about public health, but about the management of town affairs in the 19th century and perhaps beyond. Thank you for listening.